Hello, listeners. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Brom Rector, who is the founder of Empath Ventures, which invests in early stage companies operating in frontier areas of medicine like psychedelics, neurotech, longevity, and more. We dive into his career path, deconstruct some of the decisions he's made, ultimately lead to a fulfilling life and career. This is a great example of living for yourself, and I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Welcome to the Live For Yourself Revolution, where our mission is to highlight stories of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs who are truly living for themselves. I'm your host, Dr. Benjamin Ritter, leadership and career coach focused on guiding you toward a career and life you can love. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. So, Brom, I'm so curious. If you go to a cocktail party or you're just out and about and someone says hello and then they do the normal thing, they're like, oh, so what do you do? How do you answer that question? Uh, well, these days, because I've had so many conversations about psychedelics, sometimes I don't lead with, I run a VC fund that focuses on psychedelic medicine. But um, for the last two years, that that is what I have been doing. And um, naturally, you know, lots of people kind of get interested in that sort of thing because psychedelics are very much in the zeitgeist at the moment. And so that leads to often lots of interesting conversations with, with people. Um, generally, people have more things to say about that than, you know, if I had some other answer to the question. But basically what I do is I have a VC fund that invests in early stage startups that are mostly trying to turn psychedelic medicine into FDA approved therapeutics so that doctors can prescribe them, insurance companies can cover them, and that people from all walks of life all across the US can use them to improve their mental health and general well being. I think that's the short answer. Okay. I think you pitched yourself a couple of times because that was an incredible answer. And also, thank you. thank you so much for what you do. And you know, funding the frontier of medicine. I have a background in healthcare and wellness and health, and it's just incredible to see the growth of the psychedelic industry. And you know, generally, and well, I guess you know, spearheaded by individuals like yourself. But I am, I am curious. You said that it's not what you lead in with all the time now because of maybe you've done it for so often. But what else do you say then? Sometimes I just give a more vague, I'm an investor answer. You know, it just depends. I mm. think that um, sometimes when you, when you, when you're doing something for, for a while, talking about it is fun, but you can kind of kill the magic for yourself if you talk about it too much. So you don't necessarily always want to lead with the, you know, full director's cut of the pitch. And you just kind of want to give something that is, um, you know, a bit, bit more of a teaser. And then you can uh, kind of redirect the focus back to the other person and see if they actually would want to kind of go into more detail or actually appreciate the full description. We probably could come up with some puns. Be like, I like to trip people occasionally, or I like to support <laughs> people. Yes, stumbling. exactly. Uh, I like to help people move. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I could probably come up with a variety of different things, but it's also I, I can see that because even with my own industry, I love what I do. It's very fulfilling. I can see the impact. I can feel the impact. And it took me some time to get here. But when I talk about it, it doesn't have the same, unless the person I'm talking to knows what I do, it's not as invigorating or motivating and can sometimes feel like you're just kind of playing the record a little bit. So yep. it's important that you recognize that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you don't want to necessarily be giving the same high level explanation over and over again, because I think sometimes that can just make you a little bit worn out if you do it too much and you got to make sure that you kind of conserve your energy for when it's most appropriate to use it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what did you use to tell, like you probably didn't lead with that pitch. Well, you didn't over three years ago. So what was your career journey up to this point? My career journey, like most, is not really something that can be replicated. It's kind of just a it's a one-off kind of weird zigzagging of you know lots of lots of randomness and luck. But my career journey is that 
I majored in economics. And after a two or three year attempt at trying to be a music producer, I usually don't talk about this in the podcast, but spent a lot of time doing music production and songwriting and decided that I actually wanted to make money at a certain point. Uh, I was kind of done with the music industry. And I ended up going and working at a startup hedge fund as a quant researcher. And I worked at the startup hedge fund for a number of years. And that startup hedge fund ended up shutting down. But luckily, I had made some good connections with one of the largest investors in that hedge fund, which was a much bigger hedge fund, and ended up getting a job at that hedge fund. It's just $9 billion in assets that they manage. And I was a global macro portfolio manager for them. And I worked there for almost four years. So in total, I spent almost eight years in this like hedge fund world. And I liked what I did in the hedge fund world, but I didn't really love it. And you know, as time went on, the fact that I didn't love it became more and more apparent to me. But when COVID hit and I was doing my job all by myself in my apartment, I had a lot of space to really just like ruminate on this fact that I didn't love what I was doing. Again, there were plenty of good things about it, but for a number of reasons, one of the big ones just th that I didn't feel like I was having much of an impact on the world outside of making money for myself and the hedge funds clients, I just decided that, you know, it wasn't for me. And during this first year of COVID, I also happened to be coming up on my 30th birthday. And I kind of just had this idea that I wanted to go into the next decade of my life with a clean slate. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I knew it was going to be something new. So about four weeks before I turned 30, I left the hedge fund that I was working at. This was in December of 2020. And at that point, I had no idea that I was going to start a VC fund. I had no idea I was going to work in psychedelics, nothing like that. It just so happened that 2020, in addition to being the year of COVID, in addition to being you know the year that I was kind of getting fed up with my hedge fund life, it also happened to be the year that psychedelics, I think, really made the shift from this area of like mostly underground use and academic research to all of a sudden there were for-profit companies that were being funded by legitimate, very well-known investors like Y Combinator and Peter Thiel that were focused on turning psychedelics into medicine. And so all of a sudden it was like psychedelics were this area that you could start a company in, that you could invest in legitimately. And that was something that I when I first discovered psychedelics personally back in 2012, I never thought that that was going to be the case. I thought psychedelics were going to stay kind of this weird esoteric underground area forever. But in 2020, that all shifted and I started paying attention to this world of psychedelic capitalism. And after I quit my job, I had a lot of free time on my hands. And one of the things I started doing was just going down this rabbit hole of what was actually happening in the psychedelic business world. And I started talking to people that were starting these companies. I started talking to people that were investing in these companies. One of the things that I did was I started a podcast and I recorded a lot of those conversations and put them online. At that time, I was one of the few people that was actually talking about the intersection of psychedelics and business on a podcast. And so I got quite a few followers very quickly because I was you know, kind of the big fish in the small pond. And soon because of that podcast and because of all these conversations I was happening, people started sending me deals. And I was like, man, a lot of these deals seem really cool. It would be fun to invest in some of them. Maybe I should set up a fund so that I can actually invest in this, these deals that I'm getting access to. And so almost a year after leaving the hedge fund at the end of 2021, I set up the infrastructure for Empath Ventures, which is a $5 million sort of proof of concept fund focused on largely on seed stage psychedelic medicine companies. So that's kind of the long backstory of how I got here. Ooh, okay. So I have a ton of questions about the journey, but current state snapshot, how do you generally spend your days? So up until very recently, almost the majority of the time was spent focused on fundraising we're recording this in November of 2023. And anyone who's paying attention to the markets knows that the last 12 months have been very, very difficult for fundraising. And so fundraising, you never expect it to be easy, but it's been incredibly difficult the last 12 months. So fundraising really sucked up a lot of my time. Luckily, I'm very, very close to hitting the target AUM for the fund. So fundraising is kind of winding down. So the majority of the time is spent just 
finding new deals and talking, having conversations with the founders and deciding on whether or not we're going to invest in those companies. And then at this point, we've already invested in 16 companies. So there's also a fair amount of checking in on the existing investments, seeing if there's anything we can do to help. And in some cases, deciding whether or not we're going to put more money in. Mm -hmm. And today, level of job satisfaction, one to 10, 10 being the greatest, how, how are we feeling? I mean, it's such a cliche to always answer nine, you know what I mean? Because no one wants to ever answer 10, but I would say probably 10 out of 10. I mean, there's certainly a lot of challenges. This is harder than anything else I've ever done by far. But the act of kind of being at the helm of your own ship is really cool. It's a feeling that, at least for me, is very important. And, you know, I, w I definitely wouldn't go back to what I was doing before. Mm -hmm. Actually, a perfect segue, because I was going to ask, what makes this different than what you did before? I understand that the helm of your own ship, for sure, you're, you're steering. What else? There are quite a few differences. I mean, technically, what I was doing at the hedge fund and what I'm doing now is they're both considered investing, but there's a lot of different things. So the the fund that the funds that I were at were what they call quant funds, which means that you're generally writing algorithms that trade the markets automatically, basically building some sort of like economic model or machine learning model. And so I was spending 12 hours a day writing Python code. I would say hi to my boss. I'd maybe talk with my coworkers a little bit, but the job was largely sitting there, techno music playing on the headphones and writing code. Now I write no code and I talk to people all day, whether they're potential investors, whether they're founders of our perspective or current portfolio companies, et cetera. So it's a much more human-based business. And so it requires doing human things like talking, not just writing code. So that's probably the most, the, the biggest difference um, in terms of like the brass tacks, like day-to-day -day tactics. Conceptually, what I think is m much more fulfilling about the VC world to me as opposed to the the hedge fund world, and of course, everyone's going to be different. But one of the things that really kind of bugged me about this hedge fund world was that I was doing, a, I was putting a lot of effort into basically writing algorithms that would trade derivatives contracts back and forth, and I kind of would sometimes get this almost like existential dread, where it's like, does anyone really care if I do this or not? Like, who cares if we buy or sell these derivatives contracts? it doesn't have much of an impact on you know any person or any individual company for that matter in the vc world by contrast when you write a check into the seed round of a company that money is actually doing something that money is used to pay salaries or to hire someone or to be spent on uh, a research project like there's a real kind of like immediate impact in the money that you invest and so for me at least, you know, based on where I'm at in my life and the things that I value currently, it's it's much more fulfilling in that way. Mm -hmm. So there was kind of a change in meaning, a change in the actual work that you were doing. What would have been the career path if you stayed kind of in that previous job it, at that hedge fund? What were, what was the journey forward if you were to have been in that company? Yeah, the journey forward could have been. I could have stayed at that hedge fund and just continued to manage more and more money for the same fund. I could have left to work at a bigger fund, although the fund that I was at was quite large and you know there's only so many funds that are above it in the in the ranks. But yeah, I could have jumped ship to go to another fund where maybe the comp package was, you know, better in some way, although I was did pretty well. And then the other the other path forward was you know, my academic background and professional background is basically doing machine learning and data science. It happened to be on financial data, but that expertise can be applied to other domains. So there are, there were lots of people that I knew that had jobs like mine and then ended up being like a director of data science at some tech startup or something like that. So it, it probably would have been some something along those lines. Super interesting, because then you saw this opportunity in the market from psychedelics it was some it was an interest of yours it was a also you it sounds like you're just like wow okay we someone needs to step in here and there's a lot going on what was the reason though to create a podcast mm. yeah so 
I kind of skipped over it, but psychedelics have been something that's been important to me for a very long time. I I touched on the fact that I discovered them personally around 2012, so you know, over a decade ago at this point. And but they've, you know, I'm not like some guy that microdoses every day or anything like that, but I would say that there is a distinct life delineation in like mom's life before doing psychedelics for the first time and after doing them for the first time. Uh, it's the experiences that I've had on psychedelics, I don't think can be replicated anywhere else. And so while psychedelics were not the focus of my life while I was working at the hedge fund, they were something that was always in the back of my mind, something that I would consider important to me. And I would have ranked some of my psychedelic experiences amongst the you know top 10 experiences of my life in general. So this is something that I cared about quite a bit. And so when I saw that there were all of these companies that were starting up and going public on the Canadian stock exchanges in 2020 and 2021, I just thought it was amazing that there were businesses focused on psychedelics. Again, I, I cared about psychedelics and I had been you know, using them personally and reading the research for a long time, but it wasn't until 2020 and 2021 that all of a sudden there were companies being like formed around this stuff. And you can imagine to like a hedge fund guy that's interested in psychedelics, seeing that there's now a psychedelic stock is kind of a mind blowing moment. And so I just wanted to get in touch with the people that were running these companies and starting these companies and funding these companies. And generally what I, what I learned is that if you just email someone and ask to talk to them, they're like, no, who are you? But if you email them and say, Hey, do you want to talk to me in front of, you know, the people on my podcast? A lot of times people will say yes. And so the podcast was a tool to kind of satisfy my own curiosity and, you know, to make connections with people that could help me satisfy that curiosity. Mm -hmm. What a great, it, there, it wasn't, and it, and it wasn't until, you know, however many episodes in, I even had the idea of starting a fund. I was really just living off of savings and doing the podcast for fun and just to, to scratch the itch. And then later on it was, oh, let's start a fund. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to start a fund. Therefore I should create a podcast to like build my reputation or anything like that. At that time, was did you leave your previous role when you started the podcast? Because you said living on. Yeah, the I had I had been out of the role for about four months. Wow. So, what else were you working on at the time, if anything, or was it more so I'm just playing and this is my this is my this is my fun right now. I'm going to have this podcast, talk to people I'm interested in, or were there yeah. other threads that you were pulling on? A little bit. Um, basically, when I left. I said I wasn't going to do anything investing related again, or at least hedge fund related. And, and I basically made a list of 10 things that I, you know, at least on the surface level, seemed somewhat interesting. And so, you know, one of those climate tech was another one of those things. Um, I kind of forget what the other things on the list were, but I had this list. And after spending a few months just doing nothing and hanging out with my friends post, you know, leaving the job. I was like, all right, I need to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to start going down this list one by one. And I'm going to start talking to people. Maybe I'll record a podcast episode with someone in that field. Um, and it turned out that one of the first things that I touched on on that list was psychedelics. And once I started going down that rabbit hole, I couldn't stop. So I never even really got through the list. Such an important lesson right there. It, you have to explore an interest. And when you start exploring, like the magic can just naturally happen because you're investing time and energy and being intentional. It's yeah. Really powerful. And, and I also kind of got lucky and I think a right place, right time sense. So this is during COVID when everyone is sitting at home, like day trading, and there's these psychedelic stocks and there's a subreddit where there's all these people talking about these psychedelic stocks and no one was making content for them. And so when I posted the stuff that I was making, in these, you know, online spaces, it got a lot of, I got a lot of feedback very quickly. Most of it was positive, although there was like plenty of negative as well. And I think that getting stuff out in front of people and seeing that there's like an appetite for this stuff is a really good motivator to keep going. Um, it's tough to like toil away in obscurity, you know? So mm -hmm. quickly getting something together, whether it's a podcast or a blog post or whatever, and just putting it in front of people that, are hungry for that and seeing what the reception is, I think is probably the, the big takeaway there.
And I know it sounds like the first thing you touched on was psychedelics. And so there might, you might've touched other things on that list that didn't have that same level of kind of excitement and audience support or initial feedback. And you would have just kept going down the list and basically per persistence and consistency, it does lead to a lot of growth and it's, you, you say it's luck, but a lot of times our interests, they do tend to align with what we, where we spend our time. And so you were in Reddit, you created, like you created the opportunity to get positive feedback. Basically you took action to source it. Yeah. You have to create your own service area for luck as they say, but there's still, you know, the timing is, I think, I think a bit of luck. And for example, just to talk about like some of the other things, obviously at that time, you know, crypto was very popular, but there was you know, hundreds of people making podcasts and YouTube videos about crypto would have been very tough, even if that's what I was passionate about, to break through the noise at that point. Uh, with psychedelics, it so happened to be this moment where there's like a bunch of interest in this thing, but no one had really started talking about it yet um, and building like a platform and a brand. So being early really kind of helped. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. But it does seem like you merged your expertise and your interests and found a path based on also feedback from the people from the market in terms of how yes. to then take action on on what you wanted to do or create a little bit more substance around what you could do so it's like oh i have these interests and these values now the the ship that i'm going to be sailing can change depending on what the market responds with and the market responded based on your actions and here we go we're you're living and breathing the fact that you crafted your own career. Yeah, no, that, that is true. <laughs> I don't know that I can add anything to that. <laughs> well, super curious though about music. So has music can't come up? Is it in any part of your life? I'd, I'd love to learn a little bit more about this passion and what it created for you today. Yeah, I, I started playing class, taking classical guitar lessons when I was six years old. And then started playing other types of guitar. And when I was a teenager, I got really into metal music and hard rock. And I was in a ton of different, you know, shitty garage bands. And of course, I wanted to record the bands that I was in. And so I started learning how to do production. And I just loved it. I loved that you could create this thing. And I loved that you could put it in front of an audience and get feedback on it. I loved that there was like both a technical aspect on the production side, but also an artistic um, part of it. And what I also loved is that there was a lot of self-learning that one could do. Um, this was kind of like in the, you know, mid aughts. And so there was a lot of forums where people would talk, you know, trade notes on how to make things sound better. And, you know, it just seemed like this kind of endless rabbit hole. It was a puzzle. And it was really, really cool. And it was something that I, I liked a lot. And so after graduating college, I just, rather than looking for a job, I just kept making music. And I tried to ba make a career as a producer and writer. And I kind of gave up pretty quickly because it ended up being a lot harder than uh, I thought it was going to be. I didn't have any sort of safety net to fall back on. I didn't have, you know, like parents' money to kind of keep me going. And so after a while, I was like, you know what? I think this is not fun anymore. And um, in fact, I think having to rely on music to make money has kind of ruined music for me. So I'm going to go do something else. I had always thought that finance and the hedge fund world was very interesting. The idea of trying to crack the financial markets was also a puzzle in the same way that music and like trying to crack a hit song is kind of a puzzle. And so that's where I directed my energies. I also had a passion when I was younger and it overtook me and was not something that generally people succeed in it was athletics. And I could see how like, I took pieces of that and the certain benefits from it or certain components of that and integrated it into my current career. And that's where I've been happy. And I love how you mentioned how kind of the industry that you're in today has a little bit of that puzzle. And it also sounds like a lot of self-learning. So you are creating for sure. Yeah, it's a bit business can, be, and especially like on a small scale is very much a creative act. 
And I think that to take the analogy even further, investing, to, especially in the startup space, is somewhat like producing. It's like you're you're not the star of the show, but you are helping people to figure out what direction to go in. You're providing money. You're providing support. You're oftentimes providing um, like a higher level view of industry trends that the people that are working in the startup are kind of too much in the weeds to see. And you can kind of act as a bit of a guiding force, much like a music producer might act as a guiding force to a band. Again, not that the producer nor the investor takes credit for you know, why things end up becoming successes, but they certainly play a part. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give people that are thinking of maybe also starting their own thing? You're in a very unique industry, but just in general, you transitioned from a full-time gig to probably a more than full-time gig, but it's your own gig. Mm -hmm. And I mean, maybe not, maybe it's like, nope, I barely work, Ben. It's amazing. But I'm sure <laughs> there have been some learning opportunities and anything that you'd like to share, we'd love to hear. Yeah, I, I think that it's tough to give advice because, you know, most advice is not tailored to the person. And I, you know, in general, I'm very skeptical of advice. But here, with that said, here, well, here's, what we, advice, can, here's, can, here's what my advice is anyway, with, <laughs> okay. with, with that disclaimer out of the way. Great. I always knew from a young age that I kind of wanted to be doing my own thing. This is why I tried doing music. This is why, you know, even though I was working at a hedge fund, I liked the hedge fund thing because in many ways you are responsible for your own success. It's kind of an eat what you kill situation. But I knew that long run, I wanted to be, you know, running my own shop at the helm of my own ship, et cetera. And on the one hand, there are lots of, there are a lot of people that have this kind of dream to start a company, to start a fund, to start whatever it is. And they're held back by this thought that there's just one more thing that they need to do before they do the before they do the thing that they want to do. They need to save up just a little bit more money. Maybe they need to get a master's degree in the thing. Maybe they need to get work experience at like a big company that does something similar to add legitimacy to their background. Whatever it is, people just keep coming up with these one more things that they need to do before they actually do the thing that they want to do. I certainly did that. Um, in many ways, I was very concerned about having enough of a financial safety net, which of course you do need. So I'm not trying to like discount that. I had a lot of like academic insecurities and spent way too much time doing, you know, continuing education after my undergrad. And I just kept on you know, like putting these one more things on the list. And so I think if I was going to go back and talk to like my younger self, I would say, you know, you probably don't necessarily need to do all of these one more things before you actually do the thing you want to do. You should probably just like start the thing that you want to do. Um, there probably are prerequisites, but the list of prerequisites is probably a lot shorter than you think it is. So figure out what the bare minimum number of things that you need to do before you do the thing you want to do is do those as quickly as possible and then get on with doing your thing because uh you know life is short and the best time to start stuff is usually now i'm applauding that message by the way it is so critical i work with people so often you know in that first kind of sales call conversation and they they have these dreams they have this vision they want to do this thing but they've done nothing to prove that it can exist. But nothing yeah. to get a taste of it to see if they even like it. I mean, your your actions around taking, uh, basically creating a podcast and having conversations with people in that space was a great way for you to learn and build relationships and a community and deal. And eventually, that turned into deal flow just by taking that action. And I think everyone yes. can learn can learn that you don't need to wait to do one thing to get a taste of the thing that you think you might want to invest all of your career in, or at least the career right now in. So we might as well take action now instead of waiting and just live in that state of ambiguity. Why not actually, and maybe that's it. Maybe they're afraid of actually finding out that that's not what they want, or maybe it's afraid of just failing, or maybe it's whatever it is, they're holding themselves back from actually learning if that's the path that they want to take and creating that path for themselves. Yeah, people often 
you know, wait for the right opportunity or the right moment. And in the meantime, they continue pursuing, you know, master's degrees or graduate certificates or whatever. But um, it's like they're afraid to talk to a potential customer or a potential audience member or whatever. And, you know, it's just like, to use a sports analogy, it's kind of like, you always ask like, what's the best, like, weightlifting exercise to get better at like soccer or something like that. And it's like, well, actually the best training for soccer is to like play soccer. You know what I mean? Like the, the stuff off the field obviously matters, but it's really like going through the motions of doing the actual thing that really matters. So just start having conversations with people and make it happen. That's really all you can do. No amount of planning is worth anything if there's no action taken. Beautiful. Okay, so if our listeners want to take some action and find out more about you, how do they do that? Uh, so the website for the fund is empath, spelled E-M-P-A-T-H, like empathy without the Y, empath.vc. I'm on Twitter at the real Brom, and you can just type Brom Rector into LinkedIn and connect with me there. Very cool. Okay, I am now pumped. I'm going to take some actions. I want to call them micro actions. Can we do that? We're gonna micro actions. Some... We're going to micro microdose some actions. I like it. <laughs> We're going to take some micro doses and do some micro actions and pave the path for our career forwards. Personally, I'm more of a fan of macro actions, but that's just me. Two stone. <laughs> okay. So a macro action for Brom, <laughs> micro actions for Ben, and you get to choose audience, whatever you want to do yourself. Maybe even a heroic action. I don't know. Maybe even a heroic action. <laughs> You've been part of the Live For Yourself revolution. If you've enjoyed today's episode, make sure to share with a friend and spread the good word. Until next time, keep on living for yourself. <laughs>